Awesome. So my name is Tony James, and I just submitted a talk to uh, take a lesson from snowboarding to recruit kick-ass women because I come from the snowboard industry and uh, just recently uh, became a software engineer. Um, and I really wanted to, I saw a lot of similarities between what was happening in the tech industry uh, and uh, more recently in security uh, and what had previously happened in the snowboard industry where I come from. So this is on how to recruit uh, and keep kick-ass women, because what's the point of recruiting them if you don't have policies in place to keep them? And I will do my best to not talk too fast. Um, this is me, both me, both sides. This is the professional me, you know, the selfie in the bathroom. And this is also me, and I have anxiety. I'm one of the 33% that Amanda talked about yesterday that has been diagnosed with anxiety. And some days that's all I want to do is, yes, thank you, Ali Sheedy, for doing exactly what I want to do right now. Um, and this is also me. So this is, uh, this is me on the top of Mount Hutt. This is 4th of July. A bunch of the American snowboarders went out, snowboarders and skiers, to celebrate 4th of July and, you know, be awesome and ride down the hill with a flag. <laughs> um, but uh, so I am American, not Canadian. I was close, uh, only a few hours away from the border. And I qualify as an international speaker, so that's pretty cool. Um, and this was my life for a very long time, uh, pretty awesome. And uh, this is me at the top of Remarkables. I've held several positions in snowboarding. I've been an instructor for most of my life, but also was a coach. I was a company or a camp director. Um, I definitely enjoyed, um, uh, ended up traveling between um, Maine and Colorado, finally to New Zealand uh, back in 2003. In fact, I met my husband in the lift line down at Snow Park. Um, a lot of people think this is what I do all day <laughs> when you're snow work in the snowboard industry. Uh, just ride perfect cord all the time. Uh, not quite. Um, and this is pretty much what I would do all day. This is me and this is my friend uh, Emma, uh, who's we're really good friends now. Uh, but she was uh, really scared to do snowboarding because she took a lesson from her boyfriend and it was horrible. Um, so anybody who's ever, well, taken a lesson from their boyfriend um, <laughs> understands that it's not the best thing to do for a relationship. I don't recommend it. Um, but there's one thing that we do in snowboarding uh, that I think relates to a lot of uh, life and, and several things in life. And we do something called teaching for transfer. So if someone comes to me and they took a two-hour snowboard lesson and I need to teach them to snowboard in two hours, it's pretty difficult, right? They are handing me their fear. They're handing me their physical prowess. They're, they're handing me all of these things that I need to manage so that they have an enjoyable time and come back and do it again. So one thing that we work on is teaching for transfer, which means that, say, Emma came to me and she was an excellent horseback rider. And that's what she really understood. And I understood horseback riding. So I was able to get her to get into her riding stance. I was able to basically take the five things that you have to work on when you're learning to snowboard and reduce it down to two things because she had the muscle memory to already understand how to do things with her body. And I just needed to add to that. Um, and so it's a really good tool and a technique. It's a really hard technique. You know, I've had people come to me that have never done sports in their lives. So I was like, well, what do you do? And they're like, well, I play chess. And I'm like, all right, <laughs> let's think about this. What can we, you know, what can I use from chess that, that, that I can transfer into snowboarding? Um, and I definitely, uh, through, through going back and forth between Colorado and New Zealand, um, this was my office, right? This is, a, sorry for the, for the low res photo, but <laughs> this is my office. Um, notice the awesome tech that we had in snowboarding. Um, and it was, when I came out of high school, it was my choice to either go do a computer science degree, because that's what I wanted to do, or go snowboarding. And I went snowboarding, because <laughs> to me, back in the day, when a computer science degree, uh, the only thing I saw in computer science at the time for jobs and for lifestyle were, you know, a bunch of old white people uh, in the basement of like a company like GE, um, wearing short button-up shirts, you know, and it just wasn't appealing. Snowboarding was way more appealing. So I went and did that and really, really, really uh, enjoyed traveling all over the world, 
um, competing and coaching and, and doing all these things with snowboarding. But it gets to a point where you either progress into the management track or um, you kind of do the uh, seasonal, so it's every day, ev every year is winter, so you're going from winter to winter, which we did, and my husband and I enjoyed that. We went back and forth for a while, but then you miss your house, and you miss your dogs, and you miss um, your life for basically half the year, depending on where you're at. Um, and so it became really hard, and then I decided to have a family, and it became even harder. Um, traveling with the little one is great, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, but um, we did travel. We worked on it. We tried it. But once she turned two and she basically cost me another plane ticket, uh, I decided not to do that anymore. Um, but in New Zealand, where we decided to settle down, um, winter is like five months long, maybe. Um, so my career, <laughs> my work was probably four months long. Uh, and I, I, that's not sustainable, right? I had a mortgage. Um, I had a family, and my husband actually does have a sustainable uh, a course or a sustainable career in the industry. Um, and in fact, he still works at Mount Hutt, and he's been there for 20 years, um, which is fantastic. But I didn't want all our eggs in one basket. I didn't want to rely on Mother Nature uh, to take care of us and to take care of our mortgage. So I thought, all right, what can I do? And basically... I went back to the very beginning and said, hey, look, remember when I made that choice between snowboarding or programming? I'm going to go back to programming. And I thought the easiest, <laughs> easiest, I thought the best way to do this was to do a full-time university degree and focus on software engineering. Yeah, that was not easy. Um, especially not easy as a mom, not easy traveling and commuting to the university. Um, it was hard. It was very, very hard. Uh, and in fact, in the first year, is when I was actually diagnosed with anxiety. Um, and it's something that I've had and had symptoms of almost all my life, but it was, it was the second semester, it was midterms, my dog had just died, um, I was juggling a three-year-old, trying to go to university, trying not to let anybody down, and pretty much lost it during uh, a midterm. Um, and went to the free clinic and had a talk with a professional and he's like, yep, <laughs> you've got anxiety. I'm like, doesn't everybody? <laughs> like, that's fine. Um, but I got help and then um, made it through university, graduated last year, focused on software engineering, and uh, interned in software engineering, and got a job in software engineering. So woohoo, yay, success. Uh, and now this is what my desk looks like. Um, notice, the, notice the Reese's peanut butter, so still, still American. Um, but less about me and more about kick-ass women. I first want to talk about what a kick-ass woman is, right? Because not many women will be like, yeah, I'm kick-ass, hire me. Um, I will, because I know I'm kick-ass. But I know I am because I've had people my entire life tell me I am. I've had co constant positive reinforcement from people telling me how kick-ass I am and how amazing I am. and. It's really hard to say that up in front of a room full of people because <laughs> it's intimidating. Um, but I guarantee every single person in this room knows a kick-ass woman. I also guarantee there's not many this people in this room that will put their hands up and say, I am a kick-ass woman because they haven't had enough positive reinforcement in their life. So with Ben's talk yesterday about giving praise, please tell people around you that yes, you know, you are kick-ass, and you are kick-ass because of this. Um, you are an amazing person because of this. And the more that they hear that, the more they'll internalize it, and eventually they'll be able to stand up here and say, yes, I am a kick-ass woman. So I'm going to tell you a little story, because you're here, you know, to, to find out about snowboarding, right? <laughs> um, there's this company called Burton, um, and I ended up working with Burton for quite a, quite a while, uh, working on some programs, working on some women's programs. And Jake and Donna are the owners. Jake is actually one of the inventor inventors of snowboarding. A little bit of controversy there, but he is one of them. Um, and it started back in the late 70s. And when, and this is the company now. So the now it's around 1,000 people, 1,000 um, employees. They have offices all over the world, um, but they're still a privately owned company, still owned by Jake and Donna, um, which, which is important because 
it means that they were able to do things that maybe other companies can't do because they have to answer to uh, financial reports or things like that. But when snowboarding started, it was equally pioneered by both men and women. It was a sport that had no gender. It wasn't male dominated, it wasn't female dominated. It was completely equal. And a lot of people don't know this because that wasn't you know, big in the day. That wasn't, um, snowboarding was like this thing that surfers and skaters and punks and misfits kind of went and did um, in their very welcoming community. But then in 1998, the Nagano Olympics happened. And what that means <laughs> for snowboarding is boomtown. All of a sudden, snowboarding was global. Snowboarding was the coolest thing. Um, in fact, there was a gold medalist in the first snowboard event who tested positive for marijuana. So again, <laughs> made it like the, uh, the, the rad kind of thing to do uh, is to go snowboarding. Um, and Burton as a company just, boom, grew. It grew massively. And they started pulling from all these other industries because they needed people fast. They needed people in their industry, so they're pulling from ski and they're pulling from skate and they're pulling from surf. And all of those, con co all of those um, companies, all those industries, had, were, were quite male dominated. So all of a sudden, boom, Burton becomes pretty male dominated. In fact, in 2003, Jake walked into a, a board of directors meeting and there were 25 people in the room. There were three women. And Jake said, oh shit. This is what we call the oh shit moment. He realized that absolutely we've got a problem. There's no way we can be innovative. There's no way we, that we can put out new products. There's no way we can be a successful business if we've only got three people in the room, three women in the room. So he went to Donna. This is Donna. Um, she, uh, she's his wife, but also his business partner. She was away from the company for a little while, raising, raising the children, and said, look, we've got a problem. We need to fix this. Um, and you know, I think you can do the best job of this. So then she had a vision, and she had a purpose. And so she came back, and she started the Women's Leadership Initiative. Like, this is actually what it's called. It's still called this, WLI, Women's Leadership Initiative. And this initiative, basically, she went around the company and pulled women from every department, from every seniority level, and created her own round table of all of these women and said, what are the short-term opportunities we can do to increase women's leadership in this company? And what are the long-term ones we can work towards? So she took action and she sat down and they created this list of goals. And there, this is still ongoing. The, li the leaders' in initiative is still going. They're still creating new initiatives all the time. Um, and, but I'm only going to talk about three, um, kind of three categories, because these are the ones that have the most impact. Because you want to see results, right? As a company, you want to actually see growth. So they focused on family, mentorship, and recruitment. And the thing with family is when she talked to these women, no one saw themselves in the company. No female saw themselves in the company beyond five years. Definitely not 10 years in the company because as soon as they had a family, they left the company. As soon as they stopped to have kids, there was no pathway to progression to get them back into the company, into the industry. So they said, how can we fix this? And they talked about it. And in the US, they don't have paid maternity or paternity leave. So it's up to the companies to have progressive maternity leave policies. So that's what they did. They're like, all right, this is the first problem that we can solve. We can actually give you some paid maternity leave and we can keep in touch with you so that you know what's going on so that you can actually step back into your position. But then also when you step back into your position, going from zero days a week to going to five full days of work a week is really difficult for a mother from experience. So all of a sudden you have to think about before school care, if your child is even in school yet, you have to think about after school care, and before that you need to think about child care. So they offered flexible working days where you could do four day weeks or you could do limited hour days. Um, and then they also, um, <laughs> it sounds really good, like they have pi paid child care. It's, it's not that simple. But basically, if you had a child under 18 months and you traveled within your job, like many people did um, for a global snowboard company, 
then they would send a caretaker with you to take care of your child so that you could still do your job and do your business, or they would provide child care um, for any children under 18 months. For children over 18 months, they actually developed some partnerships for some with some child care organizations uh, around the company and to offer subsidized child care. So taking care of family. They also went with mentorship. Uh, and they decided to start two mentorship programs. One was a grassroots one, and one was a senior management one. So the grassroots one was for everyone, every single person in the company, and it just matched you up with someone slightly more senior, with slightly, slightly more experience, and it could be for a few months, it could be for years, it's whatever organically grew out of the mentorship. And the other one was the senior management fixed term. So for six months, anyone at a director level, because they go from director up to executive, uh, received a six-month internship from an executive. I'm sorry, a six-month uh, mentorship. I think that's what I said. <laughs> um, and what they saw was that from this program, in two years, 62% of the women that participated in this program either were promoted or moved into a line of business that better suited their goals because they were able to talk about what they wanted to get out of the company. It was so successful that everyone in the company, all of the men said, hey, <laughs> wait a minute, we want that too, because that sounds awesome. I want to progress, I want those things. So this is another example for things that they did for specifically to benefit women. They ended up um, opening up to the entire company. And also with mentorship, they, made it co they ended up making it co-ed. So you, for me, in mentorship, I have had many male mentors in my life uh, that they don't always have to be female. It is nice to have that perspective, um, but it was whatever worked for you. And then recruitment. They realized they were doing recruitment all wrong. They had no photos. They had a photo, <laughs> they had a photo advertising snowboarding, and it was a guy jumping off a 30-foot cliff. And they realized that women look at that photo, men look at that photo and be like, yeah, I can do that. And women look at that photo and be like, nope, that's not me. Snowboarding's not for me. And I, I actually remember this time in snowboarding when I would look at those photos and be like, yeah, that's not, that's not going to happen. Um, but then they started putting out marketing photos of women riding rails or um, doing wall rides or doing some really, what to me, was much more achievable. Once I saw those, I was like, yeah, I want to try that. I can do that. They also worked on programs that I ended up working on, which were the um, Women's Learn to Ride programs, which were specific programs, just women-only classes, getting them on the mountain. So that was what they did for the public. And then for within the company, um, they had Women Ride Days. And there's a, actually a, um, there's a rule on the company. It's a two-foot rule. As soon as they get two feet of snow, the company actually closes, shuts its door, and goes riding. Um, it's a pretty good run. <laughs> um, but they, they, they um, initiated this Women on the Mountain um, for, for all of their employees. And basically, they just spent a day and went riding. And uh, it's really empowering to go snowboarding with other women. It's, 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 to me, mountain biking and snowboarding is what I do. And I love taking the time and just having uh, a women-only group to do that with. And I try new things, and I feel comfortable and safe. And also, it actually had a dual purpose, <laughs> because the men saw what it was like to have a whole day without women in the office, and it was pretty rough. <laughs> they didn't get a lot done, um, so it helped. They also had the new hiring practices. They realized um, at the time they were only getting about 30% of, of their applicants were women, um, and they realized their entire hiring process was really quite biased. Um, I know in tech we have, we have lots of issues with the hiring process. Um, so what they did is they proactively sought candidates within their company and better trained, so, so female candidates within their company and better trained male managers to actually do the hiring for females. So they not only controlled the whole process, they, they, they controlled what ended up happening for women as soon as they applied, as soon as they walked through the door. Now at Burton, they're 50-50. All of their new hires, they have achieved for all of their new hires complete gender equity. Um, <laughs> and this is a good quote from Donna back in 2012. And she's like, let's be honest, you know, it, it can be frat boyish, totally frat boyish.
But as soon as you add more women to the room, you change the culture of the company. And it has, and they are extremely successful because of it. The leadership team, this, is, this goes back to the bullet point I had on the one woman policy, which is a little confusing. But the leadership team in 2004 was less than 10% female. So the one woman policy means that any leadership program uh, application basically needs to have one woman in it, at least, that does not get priority over anyone else that's applying for that position, but needs to be one woman on the table. At the moment, today, they have more than 40% female leadership within their team. So, you know, I'm spinning through this kind of fast because <laughs> I talk fast anyway. Sorry about that. But I wanted to focus on, on the end, which is basically to recruit and keep kick-ass women. You need to focus on families. You need to motivate mentorship within your company, and you need to revol revolutionize recruitment. And I hate seeing saying to anyone that they need to do something because people try to do the exact opposite you tell them. But these are facts and figures that show basically what ha in snowboarding has achieved. And I, having been in the snowboard culture and having been in the tech culture as long as I have now, I see so many similarities. When I developed this talk, I created three or four other talks on all of the similarities that can be had between snowboarding. And snowboarding can't be the only one. This is a fantastic success story of a company that has focused on implementing measures to make sure they can increase women's leadership. And there's got to be more successful cases out there. We keep looking to other companies, to other tech companies, to solve this problem. It's not Google's problem. It's not Apple's problem. It's, not, it's everyone's problem. But there's other people that have done things out there. So please, take a lesson from snowboarding. Because when you become a better place for women to work, you actually become a better place for everyone to work. So thank you.